Well, this morning, brothers and sisters, we are doing our third, fourth, third, fourth in our series on work. Um, this, this week, we are looking at Sabbath. And so, children, I have some questions for you. What is Sabbath? Anybody? Yes? Sunday! Woohoo! Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But yes, basically it's Sunday. Originally it was Saturday, but then Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday, and so we said, let's celebrate Sunday instead. So now it's Sunday. But yes, Sunday. What does it mean for you, children? What does Sunday mean for you? All right. Adults, what does Sunday mean for you? A day of rest. Excellent. Good. Wonderful. Anything else? And by adults, I mean everybody in between, too. Yes? I thought I heard something. Oh, worship. Sorry. My ear location system is not working too well, I guess. Worship. Yeah. We, we certainly we gather together as the body of Christ to worship God together. And that's a huge part of our time together on Sundays for sure. What about for when you were children, adults, and especially uh, those of us who are perhaps over the age of 50? What kinds of things were you allowed or not allowed to do on Sunday? You were allowed or not? Not allowed to play soccer. Did you love playing soccer? So that must have been, that must have been a little hard for you. No playing soccer. Okay. Anybody else? You could, you could go to church and do your chores because you had to, because the animals needed it, but that's about it. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? No shopping, yes. I remember, as do many of you probably, when um, on Sunday, pretty much everything was closed. E even if you wanted to go shopping, you really couldn't. Um, and, and you weren't supposed to anyways. Alex? Yeah, no riding a bike. Mm -mm -mm. Nope. No riding a bike. Anybody else? Yes. No going to restaurants. Yes. I love... Okay, so I've told this story like three times, so forgive me if you remember this story already, but I, I have this image constantly of all of the CRC folk rushing out of the service on Sunday morning to go have their cigarettes because you couldn't smoke in the building, and they would be looking at the Baptists and the Pentecostals driving by on their way to uh, a restaurant after church, and they would say, don't they know that this is a Sabbath? They shouldn't be doing this. And then, of course, all the Baptists and the Pentecostals are driving by going, don't they know their body is a temple to the Lord? They shouldn't be doing this. But yes, you weren't supposed to go out to restaurants on Sunday. Apparently smoking was okay at the time. <laughs> Anybody else? Going to friends' houses, you did or didn't? You did, yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure, that was one of my favorite things on Sunday. If I was at home, then I, I, my Sunday was just like John was saying. You, you went to church and you could do the chores that you had to do, but otherwise pretty much nothing. I would often end up with a headache or whatever because my parents were sleeping all day and I had to sit there twiddling my thumbs. And, uh, but I often also got to go over to my friends' houses and then we could play Lego and... I know, up Sunday, playing Lego. Oh. So those are some of the things that it has meant for us children. But there's a deeper, more important reality for Sabbath. How long did it take God to create the earth and everything in the universe, according to the Bible? Six days. Yes, absolutely. And what did He do on the seventh day, children? He rested. Yeah. See, right away, do you think God needs to rest? No, 
He's God. He doesn't need to rest. But right away, he sets up a pattern for us of working and resting. And that's what we're going to talk about today with everybody, is that pattern of working and resting. So, regardless of what you get to or do not get to do on Sunday, remember that resting is an important part of work. Well, brothers and sisters, uh, like I said, we're talking about Sabbath today, and so I would invite you to turn with me or follow along on the screen uh, for some of the Scripture passages. We're going to look at three uh, Scripture passages briefly this morning and uh, put them together in what is coming to be more and more for me uh, theological math. Um, so this is where we take, or biblical math, where we take, where we take ideas from different parts of Scripture and put them together, add them together, and see what comes out. Now, you have to be careful with that because if you're not careful with that, if you just take verses randomly from throughout Scriptures and take them out of context, then you can get totally bad conclusions. Just like if you take math, uh, if you take numbers and put them together willy-nilly and don't care about the context or the the measurement units or whatever, you can end up with bad results. If it, Yeah, the metaphor is maybe stretched a little bit there, but it's true. So, uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 2 to 3, we are looking at first. This is, of course, near the end of the uh, creation account, and we read these words. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So, on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day, seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. It is interesting to see that, that right in the very beginning, we, we first see that, that God does work, and beautiful, creative, tremendous work, but then we see very rapidly after that that God also rests and relaxes and makes that holy as well. But then we're going to move further on to Scriptures and hear what Jesus says about the Sabbath day. This is from Mark chapter, 20, or chapter 2, verses... Um, I'm, David has on there verses 27 and 28, which is perfect. That's what we're going to focus on. But just so that you do have some of that context, we're going to uh, listen to a couple of verses around that. So starting at verse 23 of chapter 2, we read these words. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they, picked, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiashar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for the priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Then lastly, for our scripture passages, we are going to look at Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And uh, we are going to look particularly at verse 16. And uh, we, will, we will get a little bit of the context from that as well. A little bit before that. Verse 13 we'll start at. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. 
He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, verse 16, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regards to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. The Word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So in order to talk about work and rest, in order to talk about Sabbath keeping, we need to remember the pattern that God set up in the very beginning. Of course, the pattern that God set up in the very beginning is that God works, and then on the seventh day, on the Sabbath, God rests. And this is a pattern that God also instituted for the people of Israel. Remember that the book of Genesis was actually not written by a, uh, a first-hand account, a witness who was there at the dawn of creation, but rather it is written by the inspiration of the Spirit in Moses' words, you know, many, many, many years later, right? So Moses who is trying, together with God, to bring the people out of Egypt, is recording and sharing with the people of God what their story is, what the story of creation is that is true as opposed to the story that they have grown up with in Egypt and in the surrounding countries, right? So so Moses is through God's inspiration, not only teaching the people of Israel some history and so on, but Moses is also teaching them a way of being, a way of living, what is right and what is good. And so the patterns that are established in Genesis are important for the rest of our lives, for the rest of the lives of the people of Israel. And this is borne out with especially Sabbath keeping when we look at the Ten Commandments in which God commands, among other things, that the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath holy and that they shall do no work on that day. Neither you nor your manservant nor your maidservant nor your ox or your donkey nor anyone else that is in your household. Right? No one is supposed to work. This is the pattern that God established. Work, rest on the Sabbath. But of course, by the time that Jesus is walking the earth with His disciples, things have shifted a bit. Things have changed a bit. And not necessarily for the better. Things have shifted in that the people of Israel under the leadership of the Pharisees have come to the place where the keeping of Sabbath is incredibly legalistic. It's not about resting. It's about keeping the rules. And I know that many of our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents we're trying very hard to honor Sabbath keeping when they laid out some of the rules that they did. And I will not stand here this morning and say that any of the particular rules that your particular family had when you were growing up were, were wrong. For all I know, looking into the context of their lives, they were exactly the right rules that needed to be there to keep your family honoring the Sabbath. However, I know that it is a constant temptation for all of us 
to fall into rule keeping alone. Partly because it's easier in a way. It's easier in a way. If I know the rules, if I know exactly what I can and cannot do, if I can make my little check mark on the box that says, yes, you did this, or yes, you did not do this, if I can do that, then I can, as it were, hold up my sheet to other people and to God and say, look, see, I did all the right stuff. I did what was good. I didn't play cards, I didn't go to the movies, I didn't go dancing, I didn't play soccer, I didn't ride my bicycle, I I rested. Right? And, And if you have made a conscious choice to set those, aside, those things aside so that you can honor God by resting completely and fully, great. But if you're doing those things so that you can put your check mark in the boxes that you need to check in order to be holy and righteous in the sight of God and others, then you're missing the point. And this is what Jesus says when He talks with the Pharisees about His disciples picking heads of grain on the Sabbath as they're walking through a field. He says, look, look, you've got it all wrong. David had far more sense than you do. David went and ate the bread that that was in the temple that was consecrated only for the the, the the eating of the priests, he went and ate that not because he was a rebellious, horrible, heretical rule breaker, but because he understood the spirit of the law and in humility and in, in obedience to God and in caring for himself and his followers, he did what needed to be done. He remembered that these laws were put in place for the good of God's people. So too, Jesus says, the law about Sabbath was put in place not so that it would end up being a burden, not so that it would end up being a checklist that you could brag about to other people or a checklist that you could use to shame other people, but rather it was put in place for your good. That's why Jesus says that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And then we move on even a little bit farther. And we look at Colossians. And Colossians is very interesting. Uh, I mean, it's all very interesting, of course, but Colossians is very interesting because now you have a burgeoning Christianity that is spreading throughout the Roman world. And Paul is speaking largely to Gentiles, but not exclusively to Gentiles in the city and the surrounding area of Colossae. Right? And so you've got a mixture of Jewish people and Gentile people who are part of this new church this new Christian church in Colossae. And there are several things that they are butting heads over. Largely, it surrounds the Jewish folk saying, hey, great, it's awesome that you are now a Christ follower. And really, because Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, that means you're actually becoming a Jew, a Messianic Jew, which truth be told, they had a point. But, then they further went on and said, okay, now that you are basically a Jew, you need to start keeping all the Jewish laws. Which means that you need to make sure that you don't eat food offered to idols, and you need to, um, you need to make sure that you observe the Sabbath, And you need to do all of these other purification rituals and various other things that are part of the Jewish law. And the Gentiles were struggling with that. 
Because this is not how they were brought up. And, and they were looking at the message of Jesus Christ and it was confusing them because they were saying to themselves, but wait, 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 wait. I thought the, that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross made us free. This doesn't sound like freedom. This sounds like lots of rules. What's this all about? What's going on? And so Paul has to write them a letter. And among other things, he deals with this question about food offered to idols and about Sabbath keeping. And it's so interesting. Because here in Colossians, Paul says to the people of Colossae, he says, one person will honor one day over another. Another person will honor all days the same. As long as they do it to the Lord, it's good. And then later on, he says, therefore, don't let anyone judge you based on what you eat. Sorry, just wanted to get the exact words here. Where did it go? New device. Sorry. Oh, look at that. Therefore, thank you, David. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regards to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. So, what does that mean? What does that mean? There have been Christ followers since that time who have said, okay, yeah, no rules. I can do whatever I want. So I want to work on Sunday. I go ahead and work on Sunday. I want to work you know, every day of the week. That's fine. I go ahead and work on every day of the week. Or when I do Sabbath, I don't need to worry about whether it's actually something that is dedicated to God because, eh, Rules. We don't need rules. Right? And, and, and there are other Christ followers who have clung to the idea of Sabbath as pretty much described in the Old Testament and say, no, 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 no. no. We need to do this. It's part of the Ten Commandments. We need to honor the Sabbath day. We need to not work. We need to not ride our bicycles. We need to not you know, do unnecessary travel. We need to not do too much cooking. We need to not do, you know, and so on and so forth, right? So who's right? Well, the answer is, and I know this sounds relative, but it is, kind of. The answer is, it depends. It depends very much, and Paul is very clear about this, it depends on what is going on in your heart and in your mind. What are you doing? Why are you doing? Are you being carried along on a whim? Do you care about your Sabbath-keeping way of life? Does it matter to you? Are you consciously choosing to spend time with God resting in Him? Or are you just sort of floating along doing whatever you want? See, because if you're just floating around doing whatever you want without paying attention to the consequences or to the reasons for why you're doing that, then you are not Sabbath keeping. On the other hand, if you are mindlessly following the rules that you have established or that somebody else established for you with regards to Sabbath, then you're not Sabbath keeping either. You see, this is very much like how Jesus talks about all of the other Ten Commandments. Right? Remember the famous one. If you even look at someone lustfully, you have committed adultery with her in your heart. Right? Jesus gets at the core, the heart of the principle of the law. And it doesn't make it easier. It doesn't make it so we don't have to do anything. It makes it harder. 
Because we don't have the excuse of just obeying the law in, in terms of the words. Oh, I didn't murder anybody. I didn't stab anybody in the heart. I didn't shoot somebody in the head. I didn't murder anybody. Ah, uh, uh, uh. uh, <laughs> Did you call them fool? Did you call them empty-headed? Are you angry with them? Then be careful because you are in danger of breaking the law. I haven't committed adultery with anybody. I didn't sleep with anybody other than my spouse. Have you looked at anyone lustfully? Have you been fantasizing about someone? It's the same with Sabbath. Are you blindly following the traditions? Then maybe you're guilty of not actually keeping the Sabbath. Are you blindly wandering around doing whatever you want? Then maybe you're guilty of not keeping Sabbath. So, what is keeping Sabbath? What is keeping Sabbath? Keeping Sabbath at its very heart is keeping a rhythm of work and rest rooted in the fact that God is God and He is the provider of all things for your life and that you have been called to follow His pattern of work and rest in acknowledgement of that. Right? Because if you constantly work, it is very easy for us to get to the point where we think that all of our success, all the good that comes to our life is, is from me. I did it. I earned it. I worked hard to get to this place. On the other hand, if you just float around doing whatever the heck you want, then it could be very much a sort of, well, laissez-faire, whatever, it doesn't matter. Right? I'm... I just do what feels good. It's all about me, my pleasure, my feeling, my happiness, my whatever. Neither one of those things is good. Instead, we pick rhythms consciously and conscientiously. For us as a community, one of our rhythms is to come together to worship in this place on Sundays, if at all we can. For others of us, we are at home online, right? And we make a choice, hopefully, about setting some, si some time aside to worship together with our family or those who are in our household. That's part of our Sabbath keeping. Part of our Sabbath keeping may be that we choose, okay, we're not going to use any electronics on Sabbath day. Why? Because it's too much about entertainment and me, 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 and I need to set that time aside. Or, or maybe it's about, let yeah, limit the chores that you only do what you have to do. Let's put food in the crock pot the night before so that, so that people can take a rest on Sunday and not, not make stuff. Because it's, so, it's such a burden for them and this way they get to spend time with God and with the family. Maybe we do a puzzle together. Or maybe we have a nap. Or maybe we go for a walk in the beautiful weather. But whatever it is, it is a conscious choice to spend time resting with God in that rhythm. Paul even talks about how some people might you know, as it were, spread out their Sabbath observance. And, and this makes sense, right? Like, let's say that you have to do a certain amount of work every week or, or, or every Sunday. Or, or maybe you're on shift work and so you have to work some Sundays. Or maybe you're an emergency worker and that's just what you have to do. Or, or maybe you just feel like you need to take a significant chunk out of each day to spend time with God. And this is not just, you know, five minutes of devotions we're talking about here. Let's say you spend 24 hours spread over the course of seven days in time with God. And that's your Sabbath. Okay? 
That's good. That's great. But the rhythm of work and rest in honoring God is the key. So, children, <clears throat> there's not very many of you here, but that's okay. I give you full 100% permission to ask your parents why you cannot do this, that, or the other thing on Sunday. Okay? But you have to really listen. All right? That's the rule. You have to really listen to what they say. Because your parents are trying to make good choices for your family to honor and worship God in this rhythm of work and rest. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that you made the Sabbath for us. Lord, Sometimes we confess it makes us uncomfortable if we don't have clear, black and white, hard and fast rules to follow. Sometimes it can make us pretty lazy too. Lord, please forgive us if our Sabbath keeping is not intentional and not something that we have thought through carefully. Please forgive us if we are not actually keeping Sabbath at all, but rather working through the whole time or, or, or <clears throat> just floating through life doing whatever without consciously setting aside time for You to be with You, to rest in You. But Lord, too, please help us to be gracious and grace-filled to one another in Sabbath-keeping. Let us, in our conscience, our good conscience, and in talking with the Holy Spirit and our loved ones, let us choose our Sabbath keeping. Let us live lives that are in the appropriate rhythm of work and rest, just as you modeled for us. And then let us stand, let us stand boldly doing that in all humility and love amongst the body of believers. Lord God, if we have not thought about our Sabbath keeping, then help us to do so today. Lord, guide us. In all of this we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen.